Does our universe contain a planet even more habitable than Earth? With our current knowledge, we have yet to discover any other inhabited planets in the vastness of our universe. But with over 5,000 exoplanets detected in just 30 years, many of them with conditions conducive to life, scientists are not giving up hope. Somewhere in the universe, there must be other planets just as habitable as Earth, and perhaps even inhabited. Dear Traveler, welcome. Today we're off to explore our universe in search of a super habitable world. But before you set off on your next adventure, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a thing. Thanks, and have a nice trip. Earth is a particularly favorable planet for the development of life. It has to be said that all the conditions are right for life to emerge and evolve. Our planet is rocky, and its physical and chemical conditions allow the presence of liquid water. Our atmosphere is compatible with life. These favorable conditions are linked to our planet's size, but also to its position in the solar system. The Earth is located in the Sun's habitable zone, the star around which it orbits in 365 days. The same conditions favorable to the emergence of life have been found on exoplanets. An Earth Similarity Index has been developed to measure the similarity of a celestial object to Earth on a scale of 0 to 1, where 1 denotes an exoplanet very similar to Earth. This index takes into account four parameters to establish a planet's similarity to Earth. Its mean radius, mass, liberation velocity, and surface temperature. To establish a planet's habitability, we therefore compare it with the Earth. But the problem facing scientists searching for life in the universe is this. An exoplanet may be habitable, but that doesn't mean it's inhabited. On Earth, living beings are made up of carbonaceous matter and water. All living things are born of a series of more or less complex chemical reactions using the chemical elements available on Earth, with water serving as the solvent for these chemical reactions. Thanks to sunlight, plants can synthesize organic matter from water mineral salts and carbon dioxide. In addition to having the right conditions for the emergence of life, the Earth offers an environment conducive to its evolution. The origin of life as we know it on Earth may not be exactly the same on other planets we can imagine other models of life. Even on Earth, we have evidence that organisms can develop in conditions that would seem rather unpromising. For example, the hydrothermal springs of oceanic ridges are home to numerous living organisms that did not develop via photosynthesis, but via chemosynthesis. Chemosynthesis consists in synthesizing organic substances under the influence of a non-light, chemical energy source. This process was discovered rather recently, since the term chemosynthesis dates back to 1897. And who knows, perhaps the discovery of life on other planets 
will hold other surprises in store for us with unsuspected processes. We now know that life may very well exist elsewhere in the universe in other forms. That's why scientists have been wondering about the existence of planets even more conducive to life than our own Earth. These planets, which are even more habitable than Earth, and could very well harbor a form of life, have been dubbed superhabitable planets. We're off to discover these superhabitable worlds. Throughout this journey, we'll discover the characteristics of a superhabitable planet, and which planets in the universe have been qualified as superhabitable worlds. On this journey to the heart of superhabitable worlds, you'll find the answers to many of the questions you're likely to be asking yourself. Are there many of these planets? How were they discovered? What do they look like? And above all, will it ever be possible to travel there? Fasten your seatbelt and take off now. The concept of a superhabitable world began with a question. What if Earth wasn't the most habitable planet? For a long time it was thought that the Earth had a unique position in the universe, that it was the only habitable and inhabited planet, and that we were therefore the center of the universe. This is known as anthropocentrism, the term refers to the idea that man is the center of the universe. For a long time, anthropocentrism was the dominant trend in the study of the universe, and even in the search for extraterrestrials. Astronomers and astrophysicists have long believed that the Earth is the center of the universe, and that everything was formed around it. Geocentrism which sees the Earth as immobile at the center of the universe, was advocated by Plato, Aristotle, and Ptolemy, among the greatest thinkers of antiquity. According to geocentrism, the Earth was immobile, and the seasons were the effect of movements external to our planet. The movements of the planets were considered perfect. There were no ellipses or linear movements, only circles, the perfect figure for the Pythagoreans. The famous philosopher Plato's vision of the Earth may still make us smile today. He saw the Earth as a sphere at the center of the universe, surrounded by a sphere of water, two Earth radii thick, then a sphere of air, five Earth radii thick, then a sphere of fire, ten Earth radii thick. The stars are located in the upper part of the sphere of fire, and the other seven planets in an intermediate part. All spheres rotate uniformly around the same axis. This same model was taken up by other astronomers and philosophers, such as Eudoxus of Sinidus and Aristotle, with modifications to explain, for example, differences in planetary latitude or variations in the speed of planetary motion. According to Aristotle's model, the universe is finite and divided into two parts, the sublunar world and the supralunar world. Below the moon's orbit is the sublunary world, where everything is in motion, unstable and uncertain. It's in this world that we live, evolve and die. In the supralunar world, everything is immutable and eternal. According to Aristotle's model, there are 55 spheres for every six planets. These concentric spheres move at different speeds, following the trajectory of a perfect circle. The first sphere is that of the moon, and the last that of the stars, which are fixed. The spheres are made of crystal, and some are only there to rotate other spheres, which explains the retrograde motion of certain stars. With Hipparchus and Ptolemy, this geocentric model became more complicated. Rather than on spheres, 
the planets were seen to rotate on wheels, called epicycles, which turn on another wheel, the deferent, with the Earth at the center. This new theory, while false, did enable the first eclipse calculations to be made. The geocentric model thus endured until the Renaissance. Gradually, however, it gave way to heliocentrism, the model according to which the Earth revolves around the Sun. Anthropocentrism is still very much on people's minds. What if Earth were indeed the only planet in our universe to harbor intelligent life? And yet, some 20 exoplanets are currently considered to be superhabitable, i.e., even more habitable than Earth. Dirk Schultz, Makuch of Washington State University, Edward Guinan of Villanova University in Philadelphia, and Rene Heller of the Max Planck Institute in Germany. They have identified 24 exoplanets that are located in their star's habitable zone and could host complex life forms. Some astronomers even estimate that there are more superhabitable planets than Earth-like planets. German astrophysicist Rene Heller, one of the authors of this study, claim that planets slightly more massive than Earth and orbiting a star smaller than the Sun could be even more conducive to life than our own planet. But what exactly are superhabitable planets? How are they defined? How do they differ from Earth? And what are their specific characteristics? Let's explore the concept of superhabitable worlds so you can better understand why some astrophysicists are convinced that Earth isn't necessarily the most habitable planet in the universe. Superhabitable planets are planets or moons with conditions that are even more conducive to the emergence and evolution of life than Earth. Of course, such planets remain hypothetical for the time being. In their detailed report, Superhabitable Worlds, published in January 2014 in the journal Astrobiology, the astrophysicist detailed the characteristics of these superhabitable worlds. Basically, it's a list of criteria that a planet would have to meet to qualify as a superhabitable world. These criteria include, but are not limited to, intrinsic criteria linked to the planet's characteristics. To qualify as a superhabitable planet, an exoplanet must first orbit a star of spectral type K, known as an orange dwarf. By comparison, the Sun is a G or yellow dwarf star. The most common stars in the universe are red dwarfs of spectral type M. Orange dwarfs are of great interest in the search for extraterrestrial life, as their stability time on the main sequence is longer than that of a star like the Sun. In fact, an orange dwarf is stable for 18 to 34 billion years, whereas the Sun is stable for only 10 billion years. Life is therefore more likely to emerge and develop on a planet orbiting an orange dwarf. What's more, orange dwarfs emit less ultraviolet radiation than yellow dwarfs. UV radiation can damage DNA, making it more difficult for life to emerge. What's more, orange dwarfs are thought to be three to five times more abundant than yellow dwarfs like our sun, making it easier to find life around this type of star. For an exoplanet to qualify as a superhabitable world, it must be between 5 and 8 billion years old. That's right, because if an exoplanet is to be home to complex life forms, 
it has to be old enough for them to have had time to emerge and evolve and become more complex. On Earth, the first multicellular organisms did not appear for several billion years. According to researchers, between 5 and 8 billion years is the optimum time frame for the development of complex life forms before the planet has had time to exhaust its geothermal resources or lose its magnetic field. A superhabitable planet is theorized to be more massive than Earth, up to 1.5 times more massive and at least 10% wider than our planet. A planet with a mass 1.5 times greater than Earth's would be able to retain a significant atmosphere and internal temperature. What's more, the more massive the planet, the more likely it is to have expanses of habitable land, although it is of course possible for extraterrestrial life to develop entirely underwater. We have proof of this in the form of ocean planets, which are not superhabitable worlds, but could harbor life. On Earth, moreover, the underwater world is home to a very rich biodiversity, even in places that might seem highly inauspicious, such as the hydrothermal springs on ocean ridges that we mentioned at the start of this journey. Granted, marine biodiversity on our planet represents only 13% of all described living species, but that's because our knowledge of bacteria, microorganisms, and protists, which make up a large part of the underwater living world, particularly at great depths, is still rather limited. In reality, the underwater world hides many species of microorganisms and bacteria that we don't yet know about, and it's very likely that on ocean planets there is also a rich and varied marine ecosystem. Let's return to the criteria that define a superhabitable planet. According to the three researchers behind the study, this type of planet revolves more slowly than the Earth around its star. Its surface temperature would be around 5 degrees Celsius warmer than that of the Earth. A temperature that would be ideal given that on Earth, tropical climates are conducive to the emergence of a rich biodiversity. In fact, the richness of our planet's flora and fauna increases as we move away from the poles towards the tropics. In tropical forests we find a wide variety of species of all biological types. Trees, lianas, shrubs, grasses. A planet with a tropical climate, 5 degrees Celsius or 9 degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average than Earth, would therefore be particularly conducive to the emergence of rich biodiversity. Still, according to the astrophysicists behind the publication in the journal Astrobiology, a superhabitable planet would have an atmosphere composed of 25 to 30 percent dioxygen, with the remainder made up of inert gases, i.e. gases that do not take part in any chemical reaction, such as dinitrogen. The presence of clouds and humidity is an indispensable criterion for the emergence of life, and such an atmosphere would offer ideal conditions. Like the Earth, a superhabitable planet would be composed of land and water, distributed in such a way as to include shallow waters and archipelagos. It's possible that superhabitable planets could have a natural satellite with a mass 1 to 10 percent their own. This natural satellite would be neither too close nor too far away at a distance of between 10 and 100 planetary radii. Finally, a superhabitable planet would feature a geological and geochemical recycling mechanism, like the Earth and its plate tectonics, and would have a fairly strong protective magnetic field. In fact, the superhabitable worlds theorized by this team of astrophysicists would resemble the Earth, only better. They would be older, 
bigger, warmer, and wetter. For many astrophysicists agree that contrary to what has been thought until now, the Earth does not in fact represent an optimum for planetary habitability. All its characteristics, such as the depth of its oceans, the intensity of its magnetic field, its geological activity, and its surface temperature, could be even more propitious. There could be planets in the universe that would have allowed life to appear earlier. They would then have more time to develop and evolve. Would searching for superhabitable planets in the universe be more efficient than looking for planets with a high terrestrial similarity index? Yes, according to Rene Heller and John Armstrong, the fathers of the superhabitable world concept. There could be planets that don't resemble the Earth, yet have characteristics that are more conducive to the development of a rich and diverse flora and fauna. However, the similarity index isn't a bad thing. It just needs to be set against other criteria. What Rene Heller and John Armstrong mean is that this concept should not be the only one studied to determine a planet's habitability. For example, the exoplanet TRAPPIST-1d, with a similarity index of 0.90, .90, is the known planet with the highest similarity index to Earth. This planet, 40 light years away, is habitable, but not super habitable. There is indeed a difference between habitable and super habitable. But why? Simply because this planet orbits a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are particularly unstable, with frequent eruptions, and therefore don't offer optimal conditions for the emergence, and above all, the long-term development of life. So it's entirely possible that TRAPPIST-1d could be inhabited, but for that to happen, very specific conditions would have to be met at atmospheric level to ensure that any form of life is protected from eruptions and ultraviolet radiation. You'll have understood that the search for planets in the habitable zone which has long been the basis of the search for extraterrestrial life isn't necessarily effective. Or at least it's not the only criterion to consider. Just because a planet is located in its star's habitable zone doesn't necessarily mean it's home to life. There are many other criteria to take into account, and not all of them are based on Earth. But what are we talking about? when we speak of a habitable zone. The habitable zone of a planetary system is the zone around the star where planets could have liquid water if all other conditions were met. In the search for extraterrestrial life, the notion of the habitable zone is very important because on Earth it is water that makes the emergence of life possible. For a planet in the habitable zone to harbor liquid water, other conditions must be present, notably a surface temperature of between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, i.e. between 32 and 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and sufficient mass to retain water and atmosphere. The habitable zone varies from one planetary system to another. Around a red dwarf, a star colder than a yellow and orange dwarfs, the habitable zone is closer to the star. What's more, the older a star gets, the brighter it becomes, and the further away the habitable zone becomes. In our solar system, for example, the habitable zone is between 0.95 and 1.5 astronomical units, one astronomical unit being equivalent to the distance between the Earth and the Sun. However, the search for exoplanets containing water should not be confined to the habitable zone of a star system. 
a planet may be located slightly outside the habitable zone, but harbor liquid water beneath a frozen surface. In fact, some ocean planets are said to be entirely covered by a liquid ocean under a thin layer of ice. They could be home to amazing underwater creatures like those found in the abysses of our terrestrial oceans. For example, some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, such as Ganymede and Enceladus, are thought to be tidally heated ocean worlds. Be careful not to confuse the stellar habitable zone with the galactic habitable zone. We've just talked about the stellar habitable zone, but the galactic habitable zone is another concept. For life to appear on a planet, it must not only be neither too close nor too far from its star, it must also be close to the center of the galaxy. It's in this zone that there are enough heavy elements to favor the formation of telluric planets and atoms indispensable to life, such as iron, found in hemoglobin, or copper, found in hemocyanin, the protein responsible for transporting and storing oxygen in the blood of many invertebrates. On the other hand, the planet shouldn't be too close to the center of the galaxy where it would be exposed to radiation from supernovas, comet and asteroid showers, or the suction of black holes. Indeed, just about every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center. The Milky Way, our own galaxy, has one called Sagittarius A, located 27,000 light years from Earth. It is 4 million times more massive than the Sun, Black holes are very powerful and can suck in dust and gas, as well as stars and planets that get too close. So you see, superhabitable planets can't be too close to the center of the galaxy, or they'll be sucked in at some point in their lives. Determining the galactic habitable zone is a highly complex task. In the Milky Way, our galaxy, this habitable zone would be located 25,000 light years from the galactic center and would extend over 6,000 light years. But this doesn't mean that the galactic habitable zone is the same in other galaxies. In fact, it may not even exist in some galaxies. In any case, the Earth is located both in the galaxy's habitable zone and in the habitable zone of the Sun around which it orbits. Our planet is therefore far from deadly neutron stars, dangerous black holes, and gamma ray bursts, which are very brief but powerful random electromagnetic radiation. If a gamma ray burst were to hit the Earth, the consequences could be disastrous. One of the five mass extinctions of biodiversity, the one that hit the Earth 440 million years ago, could have been caused by this phenomenon. A gamma ray burst could destroy 30% of the ozone layer for almost 10 years, doubling the power of UV rays. Phytoplankton, the basis of the oceanic food chain, would be completely carbonized. But that's not all. Large quantities of nitrogen oxide would form in the atmosphere which would turn yellow-orange and produce acid rain. With the reduction in photosynthesis, around 60% of food production would collapse, with all the consequences we can imagine for the functioning of biodiversity. Now you know why finding habitable planets is so complicated. Many conditions have to be met, and such a planet would need to be protected from the many dangers of the universe. Now we're off to discover superhabitable worlds. What do they look like? Where are they most likely to be found in the vastness of the universe? 
let's discover the characteristics of these worlds which could be even more conducive to life than our own Earth. Superhabitable worlds, as defined by Heller and Armstrong, are larger than Earth. Superhabitable planets have a mass about two times that of the Earth, and a radius of 1.3, the Earth's radius. According to astrophysicists, this size is optimal for plate tectonics. Superhabitable worlds have a stronger gravitational attraction than the Earth's, allowing for better gas retention during their formation. As a result, their atmospheres are denser, with higher concentrations of oxygen and greenhouse gases. This concentration of gases raises the average temperature to levels of around 25 degrees Celsius, or 77 degrees Fahrenheit which is optimal for the emergence of plant life. Thanks to a denser atmosphere than Earth's, superhabitable worlds have a more regular surface relief, allowing water to cover a larger area while reducing the size of ocean basins. Shallow areas are more conducive to the development of a diversity of marine and aquatic species as they receive more heat and light. A planet with shallower average ocean depths than Earth's would therefore be likely to have greater aquatic biodiversity. These characteristics are basic conditions for a planet to be even more habitable than Earth. The more mass of a planet, the stronger its gravity. The shallower its basins, the more hospitable it is to life. From a geological point of view, the optimum mass of a superhabitable planet is around two Earth masses, with a radius between 1.2 and 1.3 times the Earth's radius, so that the density is close to that of the Earth. Indeed, these are the optimum conditions for plate tectonics, which can occur if the planet has a mass between 1 and 5 times that of the Earth ideally two Earth masses. Plate tectonics is the set of movements of the plates that make up the lithosphere, the Earth's outer solid envelope. These movements are caused by convective movements of the mantle. Plate tectonics and the presence of large bodies of water are essential conditions for maintaining a constant level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Superhabitable worlds must therefore be geologically active, with geological activity strong enough to generate a sufficient quantity of greenhouse gases. The greenhouse effect is important for raising the planet's overall temperature above the freezing point of water, and thus maintaining water in a liquid state. If geological activity were not intense enough to maintain this greenhouse effect, it would have to be compensated for by an internal heat source such as the tidal effect. But this tidal effect would have to be very intense. Tidal heating also poses another problem in the case of superhabitable planets. When one object is in an elliptical orbit around another, the tidal force acting on it is strong. This rotating object is then subject to continuous deformation movements that generate friction inside it. The energy produced by this friction is released in the form of heat and gradually modifies the orbit of the rotating object, which becomes less and less elliptical and more and more circular until it is in synchronous rotation. But that's not what we want. A superhabitable planet must by definition present optimal conditions for the emergence and development of life, and, if the planet is in synchronous rotation, one side of the planet will be very hot and the other very cold. 
life could ultimately develop at the boundary between the two hemispheres, but we can't really talk about optimal conditions. This is why we prefer the hypothesis of geological activity intense enough to maintain a greenhouse effect in the case of superhabitable worlds. Let's continue exploring the characteristics of superhabitable planets. The magnetosphere is an important feature of our planet, protecting living organisms from the dangers of the universe. Do superhabitable planets have a magnetosphere like the Earth? The Earth generates its own magnetic field. It is therefore surrounded by a magnetic bubble, generated by the difference in speed between the rotation of the planet and its liquid core, called the magnetosphere. The magnetosphere protects the planet from external aggressions, such as cosmic rays. Cosmic radiation is the flow of atomic nuclei and high-energy particles circulating in the interstellar medium. It is dangerous for us because it can break DNA and cause cancer or genetic malformations. These rays can also damage our electronic equipment. The magnetosphere also protects our planet from solar winds, streams of particles consisting mainly of ions and electrons, which are ejected from the sun's upper atmosphere. Perhaps you've already heard of the polar aurora? These luminous phenomena visible at high northern or southern latitudes more commonly referred to as Aurora Borealis or Aurora Australis, depending on the pole, are magnificent to behold. But they occur when certain particles of the solar wind enter the atmosphere. And solar winds are as dangerous to us as cosmic rays because the storms created by these particles damage our satellites and disrupt radio transmissions in 1989, a solar windstorm caused a major blackout in Canada and the USA, resulting in major electrical storms and the corrosion of pipelines for several kilometers in Alaska. In fact, solar winds are comparable to radioactive radiation. The Earth is not the only planet surrounded by a magnetosphere. All the planets with magnetic fields such as Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have their own magnetospheres. Venus has none, as it has no internal magnetic field. As for Mars, researchers have observed traces of an ancestral magnetic field, which has now disappeared. The red planet may therefore have had its own magnetosphere in the past, but it disappeared along with its magnetic field. The magnetosphere is essential to protect life on a planet. Superhabitable planets must therefore have a sufficiently powerful magnetosphere, which would act as a shield against cosmic radiation, stellar winds, and other phenomena dangerous to the development of life. The rotation of a superhabitable planet must not be synchronous or too slow as the magnetosphere would then be too weak. This would cause part of the atmosphere, notably hydrogen, to escape into the atmosphere. This is why planets orbiting in the habitable zone of a red dwarf, which in theory rotate synchronously around their star, cannot be superhabitable planets. Let's continue our exploration of superhabitable worlds. You're probably wondering what the weather is like on these planets, and more importantly, what the climate is like. Because climate and biodiversity are closely linked. For a planet to be habitable, it doesn't necessarily have to have exactly the same temperatures and climate as Earth. In fact, we don't know what temperature would be optimal for life on Earth. What we do know 
is that biodiversity was richer during warmer periods. We can therefore affirm that planets with average temperatures slightly higher than Earth's would be more suitable for the emergence and development of life. The oceans play a major role in regulating a planet's climate. They are in constant exchange with the atmosphere, absorbing and then releasing enormous quantities of heat via currents. An ocean can store a quantity of heat 1,000 times greater than that of the atmosphere and release it very slowly over several centuries. This thermoregulatory effect of the oceans helps to maintain a moderate temperature on the planet's surface, conducive to life. Superhabitable planets should be warmer than the Earth, but orbit farther from their star than the Earth does from the Sun. Indeed, the Earth is already quite close to the inner edge of the solar system's habitable zone. However, the luminosity of main sequence stars, of which the Sun is a part, increases over time. This pushes the habitable zone outwards. In one to three billion years, the Earth will no longer be habitable. Superhabitable planets must therefore be found closer to the center of the habitable zone. To keep the temperature high, they must have a thicker atmosphere than Earth's and a higher concentration of greenhouse gases. There's another factor to consider when profiling a superhabitable planet, the star around which the planet orbits. The type of star largely determines the characteristics of the stellar system and will therefore influence the habitability of a planet. That's right, because not all stars have the same characteristics or the same lifespan. The most massive stars, type O, B, and A, have very short life cycles and are not suitable for planet formation. So what about the least massive stars, type M and K, which are the most common in the universe? These are the longest lived stars, but their low luminosity reduces the size of the habitable zone. What's more, these stars are notoriously unstable, so the planets around them are frequently exposed to flares of ultraviolet radiation. If their atmosphere isn't thick enough, this is a major obstacle to the emergence and development of life. Planets orbiting an M or K-type star, if they are close together, are in synchronous rotation. We spoke about this earlier in this journey. A planet in synchronous rotation will always present the same side to the star around which it orbits. As we've seen, you can't call a planet superhabitable if one hemisphere is probably too hot for life and the other too cold. Life on planets orbiting red dwarfs remains possible, but these planets are not superhabitable. The most massive stars and the least massive stars are therefore not all that conducive to the emergence and development of life. K-type stars, or orange dwarfs, are the happy medium between these two extremes. Because they are stable over a very long period, they provide the planets orbiting them with a stable, habitable zone, far enough away that the planets are not overly exposed to ultraviolet radiation. Orange dwarfs emit less ultraviolet radiation than red dwarfs, or even the sun. Planets around an orange dwarf don't necessarily need an atmosphere or a protective ozone layer. The star's luminosity is sufficient to allow the development of complex life forms. According to some studies, the stability of the Earth's orbit could be a hindrance to biological evolution. Superhabitable planets could therefore have higher orbital eccentricity with seasonal, habitable regions or tidal heating. We're 
now going to study the atmosphere of a superhabitable planet. According to scientists, there is no solid argument that Earth's current atmosphere is the most optimal for the development of life. So most likely, there could be other combinations of elements that are even more conducive to life. Let's take a look at the characteristics of a habitable planet's atmosphere. Animal life as we know it needs an atmosphere with sufficient oxygen. Plant life, on the other hand, needs a sufficient quantity of carbon in the atmosphere, in the form of carbon dioxide, to ensure photosynthesis. A balance in greenhouse gases is essential to maintain a stable, habitable temperature. The Earth's atmosphere is rather unusual. It is rich in nitrogen and oxygen, but very low in CO2. The dominant greenhouse gas is not CO2, but water vapor. This has not always been the case. 4.6 billion years ago, the early Earth's atmosphere consisted mainly of helium and hydrogen. Ward and Brownlee's model indicates that there was then an oxygen revolution. Around 2.5 billion years ago, the formation of continents provided more and more suitable habitats for the development of stromatolites, which released oxygen into the sea. This oxygen remained bound to the iron dissolved in the oceans until around 1.8 billion years ago, when it began to be released into the atmosphere. Prokaryotic bacteria continued to release oxygen into the atmosphere. During the Carboniferous period, the maximum level of oxygen in the atmosphere was estimated at 35% by volume. This same period saw the development of a rich biodiversity. It is therefore assumed that the presence of a significant quantity of oxygen in the atmosphere is essential for the development of complex life forms. We also need to talk about atmospheric density. What would be the optimum density for the development of life? If the atmospheres of superhabitable planets were less dense than Earth's, they would be less protected from cosmic radiation, and there would be very significant thermal differences between day and night, or between equatorial and polar zones. Precipitation would also be more unevenly distributed resulting in very dry and very wet zones. As you can see, a sparsely populated atmosphere would not be ideal for the development of life. On the other hand, an atmosphere denser than Earth's would be more favorable to life, especially since superhabitable planets are more massive than our planet, and more massive planets must have a higher atmospheric density. At the start of this journey, we talked about the antiquity of superhabitable planets. According to the researchers who theorized the notion of a superhabitable planet, planets older than the Earth could possess greater biodiversity. Not only would species have had more time to evolve, but environmental conditions would have had time to adapt to create even more favorable conditions for life. By the way, remember, that superhabitable planets orbit orange dwarfs, which are more stable for longer. The habitable zone of orange dwarfs recedes less rapidly than that of yellow or red dwarfs. Superhabitable planets can therefore be habitable for longer than the Earth. Under these conditions, it doesn't matter if they're older than the Earth. It doesn't mean they're nearing the end of their habitability period. It all depends on the criteria for qualifying as a superhabitable planet. Do you doubt the existence of such planets? Or do you think that if they do exist, there really aren't many of them? Let's go back to the report published in January 2014 in the journal Astrobiology. 
According to the astrophysicists, there are 24 potential superhabitable planets. So there could be more superhabitable planets than terrestrial planets. In fact, there are more orange dwarf stars than sun-like stars. To calculate this figure, the researchers analyzed the 4,500 exoplanets that had been discovered to date. They first selected planets in stellar habitable zones from the Kepler Telescope Archive. They then examined systems with K-type stars, i.e. orange dwarfs, and G-type stars like the Sun, but cooler, and so on. Criterion by criterion, they ended up with a list of 24 potential superhabitable worlds. Does this figure sound impressive, given the conditions that must be met for planets to be superhabitable? Well, simply by being more massive than Earth, these planets can spontaneously meet many of the criteria we've been talking about. In fact, many of the criteria flow from one another. A planetary body with two to three Earth masses will have more perennial plate tectonics and a larger surface area than the Earth. The effect of gravity on the Earth's crust would not only affect the depth of the oceans, but also the intensity of the gravitational field and the density of the atmosphere. Of these 24 exoplanet candidates for the title of superhabitable planet, only one has been confirmed, Kepler 1126b. What's more, the planets on the list are all more than 100 light years away, which makes observing their characteristics rather complicated. However, this discovery has given astrophysicists great hope, and the new, more powerful telescopes, starting with the James Webb, will certainly be able to tell us more about these planets that may be superhabitable. Wondering which planets are on the list of superhabitable worlds? Fasten your seatbelts, we're off to explore the most remarkable of the superhabitable planets. Before we begin our journey to the heart of the planets, Let's take a look at exoplanet Kepler-69c, located 2,700 light-years from Earth. Kepler-69c was initially thought to be superhabitable, before analyses revealed that it is probably similar to Venus. In the end, therefore, it was not considered habitable, and yet this super-Earth-like planet orbiting in its star's habitable zone was at the time of its discovery in 2013 considered one of the most Earth-like planets. Other planets have appeared on the list of superhabitable worlds before being withdrawn, like Kepler-69c. Such is the case of exoplanet HD 85512b, discovered in 2011, 36 light-years away in the constellation of the Veils. When it was discovered, HD 85512b was one of the most habitable exoplanets identified, located at the upper limit of its star's habitable zone. However, the habitable zone models for the star HD 85512 have been updated, and it turns out that the planet is in fact outside the habitable zone. It is therefore not habitable, let alone superhabitable. The same thing happened to the exoplanet Tau Ceti F, located in the Whale constellation, 12 light years from Earth. A pity, since both planets were relatively close to us, which would have facilitated the search for intelligent life. Let's start our exploration of superhabitable planets with Kepler-1126b, the only exoplanet on the list that has been confirmed as superhabitable. Unfortunately, it's a long way from us. It's more than 2,070 light-years from Earth. 
discovered in 2016, this exoplanet has been classified as a super-Earth. A super-Earth is an exoplanet with a mass between that of the Earth and that of a giant planet. We could say that all super-inhabitable planets are super-Earths, since their mass would have to be around twice that of our planet. We often tend to confuse super-Earths, habitable planets, and super-habitable planets, but these are very different concepts, even if they cross and recross. Kepler-1126b orbits a G-type or yellow dwarf star, like the Sun. Its mass is equivalent to 3.64 times that of the Earth. Located about 0.43 astronomical units from its star, Kepler-1126, and therefore closer to the Sun than the Earth, its orbit is logically shorter, taking 108.6 days for the record, the exoplanet Kepler-1126b was so named because it was discovered by the American Kepler Space Telescope. Like many others, it was given the name Kepler, followed by a number and the letter B, indicating that it was the first exoplanet discovered around its star. The other exoplanets on the list were also discovered by the Kepler telescope. This telescope which was launched in 2009 and completed its mission in 2018, had as its main objective to identify all the exoplanets detectable in a given area of the Milky Way. To detect these terrestrial exoplanets, the Kepler telescope used the transit method, which measures the change in brightness of a star when a planet orbiting that star passes between the telescope and the star. By the end of its mission, Kepler had detected 2,662 planets confirmed by other observations, more than half of the exoplanets discovered to date. A large proportion of the more than 5,300 exoplanets discovered by 2023 are therefore named after this Kepler telescope. Let's continue our journey of exploration of super-inhabitable worlds. The most promising candidate for a super-habitable planet to date is an exoplanet called KOI 5715.01. Like Kepler 1126b, it's still a long way from us, 2,964 light years from our solar system. As far as we know, this planet meets most of the criteria that make an exoplanet a superhabitable world. It's older than Earth at 5.5 billion years compared with 4.5 billion years for our own planet. It is also more massive, 1.8 times larger than Earth. Its equilibrium temperature is slightly higher than Earth's, minus 13 degrees Celsius or 8 degrees Fahrenheit versus minus 18 degrees Celsius or 0 degrees Fahrenheit for our planet. As a reminder, the equilibrium temperature of a planet is the theoretical temperature of its surface, assuming it is uniform, in the absence of atmosphere. These data should be treated with caution, as KOI 5715.01's atmosphere has not yet been analyzed. Indeed, it is still impossible to measure the composition of the atmosphere of this planet, which is very far from the Earth. Let's continue our exploration with exoplanet KOI 4878.01. This planet is located some 1,075 light-years from Earth in the constellation of the Dragon. It orbits an F-type star, a type of main-sequence star we haven't yet encountered on this trip. F-type stars are brighter than the Sun, 
with fainter hydrogen lines in their spectrum than A-type stars such as Sirius, the brightest star in our night sky, but stronger than G-type stars like the Sun. Known F-type stars include the Alpha Star in the Little Dipper, which you probably know as the Pole Star. In fact, the second brightest star in our night sky after Sirius is a spectral F-type star called Canopus. It's the only star whose brilliance can rival Sirius. Let's return to KOI 4878.01. This exoplanet has been classified as a superhabitable planet because it has characteristics very similar to those of Earth, and even better in some respects. Its orbital period is higher than Earth's, as it orbits its star in 449 Earth days. It is probably slightly more massive than Earth, with a mass of between 0.4 and 3 Earth masses. Its radius is slightly greater than that of our planet, at 1.05 Earth radii. The equilibrium temperature of KOI 4878.01 is around 16.5 degrees Celsius, or 3 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very slightly higher than that of the Earth, at minus 18 degrees Celsius, or 0 degrees Fahrenheit. If we assume that KOI 4878.01's atmosphere were similar to Earth's, then its surface temperature would be slightly higher, at 17.85 degrees Celsius, or 62 degrees Fahrenheit, versus 15 degrees Celsius, or 59 degrees Fahrenheit on Earth. Ideal conditions for life. As for its star, it's slightly less massive than the Sun, but 5% larger, with a higher temperature of 5,758 degrees Celsius, or 10,396 degrees Fahrenheit, compared with 5,498 degrees Celsius, or 9,928 degrees Fahrenheit for the Sun. Although the star's age is unknown, astrophysicists believe it to be older than the Sun, given its metallicity and relatively high space velocity. Among the 24 exoplanets classified as superhabitable worlds is KOI 456.04, located just over 3,000 light-years from our solar system in the Lyra constellation. KOI 456.04 orbits a star called Kepler-160, whose mass and radius are very close to those of the Sun. Kepler-160 has a surface temperature 300 degrees Celsius or 539 degrees Fahrenheit lower than the Sun. This star is at the heart of a multi-planetary system with at least three exoplanets orbiting it. It's not the first two planets discovered in 2010, Kepler-160b and Kepler-160c that interest us today as they are relatively close to the star, and therefore far too hot to be habitable. On the other hand, the third planet, Kepler-160d, or KOI 456.04, detected in 2020 by a team from the Max Planck Institute, is classified as a superhabitable planet. This planet was detected thanks to the observation of minute variations in the orbital period of Kepler-160c. KOI 456.04 is a rocky planet with a mass slightly less than twice that of the Earth. It orbits its star in 378 days, slightly longer than the Earth. It receives 93%
of the light that the Earth receives from the Sun and is located at a distance from its star that could allow surface temperatures favorable to the emergence of life, if the other conditions are met, of course. Astrophysicists don't have much more information on this promising but very distant exoplanet. Kepler-160d shows no transits in its star's light curve. Analyses have therefore been based on indirect data. Researchers can, however, put forward a number of hypotheses. If KOI 456.04's atmosphere is essentially inert, i.e. made up of non-reactive gases such as nitrogen or CO2, and has a slight greenhouse effect, then the planet's surface temperature could average plus 5 degrees Celsius or 41 degrees Fahrenheit, i.e. 10 degrees Celsius or 18 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than that of Earth. All this, of course, remains speculation. In fact, astrophysicists are still not even sure that KOI 456.04 is a real planet and not a statistical error. Its discovery is very recent, and at such a distance it's hard to be certain. According to researchers, there is an 85% chance that KOI 456.04 is a real planet. To be officially recognized as a planet, however, the probability must reach 99%. To find out for sure, we'll have to wait for the launch of ESA's PLATO space mission in 2024. The PLATO mission, which stands for Planetary Transits and Oscillations of Stars, will study planetary transits and stellar oscillations over a six-year period. Its primary objective is the discovery of Earth-sized planets around Sun-like stars Let's continue our exploration with a planet called KOI 7711.01. Located 1700 light years away, this planet is close to the size of Earth and orbits a star that is similar to our Sun. Its discovery was announced on June 19, 2017 by NASA during a presentation of the latest extrasolar planets found during the Kepler mission. However, at present, not much is known about this planet. We don't even know if it contains liquid water. And even if it looks like Earth's twin sister, without knowing its atmospheric conditions, we can't really say with any certainty that this planet is habitable or even superhabitable. All the other planets on the list of superhabitable worlds are similar to KOI 7711.01 in the sense that very little data is currently available on them. As new discoveries are made, these superhabitable planets like HD 85512b or Tau Ceti f could eventually be removed from the list. Another example is the exoplanet KOI 5554.01. This exoplanet, located 701 light years from us, was discovered relatively recently, so information is still lacking. However, it has been classified as a superinhabitable world because it is about 1.29 times larger than Earth but it's also older than our planet, being 6.5 billion years, 2 billion years older. Once again, this information should be taken with a grain of salt, as astrophysicists have yet to confirm it. There could be a margin of error of the order of billions of years. As you can see, everything is still very uncertain. We also know 
that the average temperature of this planet should be around 26 degrees Celsius, or 78 degrees Fahrenheit, some 10 degrees warmer than on Earth, which is favorable for being considered a superhabitable planet. For the moment, we don't know any more, but astrophysicists should soon be taking a closer look at this exoplanet, which is nonetheless less distant than some of the other superhabitable planets on the list. It's all very well looking for habitable planets, but let's suppose that one day we find a superhabitable planet in the universe that harbors intelligent life and a rich and varied biodiversity. Could we get there? Could we live there and rebuild our civilization? It's a question that many people ask themselves, and one that you may already have asked yourself one day. When our planet reaches the end of its lifespan, will it be possible to find another planet with similar or even more favorable conditions on which to perpetuate humanity? Under current scientific conditions, reaching an extrasolar planet is impossible. Take the example of NASA's New Horizons probe, which was sent out to explore Pluto and its satellites between 2006 and 2015. This probe traveled 3 billion kilometers, or 1.8 billion miles in nine and a half years. To enable the probe to reach Pluto, located at the edge of our solar system, Within a reasonable time frame, the probe's launcher achieved a speed record for the time, 45 kilometers per second, or 28 miles per second. Without gravitational assistance, it would have taken the probe more than 20 years to reach Pluto. Now, imagine trying to reach this dwarf planet by plane with our current terrestrial means. It would take us 732 years. And even then, Pluto remains a dwarf planet in our solar system, and it's the extrasolar planets we're interested in, some of which are located 3,000 light years away, whereas a single light year represents 9.65 trillion kilometers. At the speed of NASA's New Horizons probe, it would take 19,000 years to cover just one light year, a dizzying calculation. Here's another example to illustrate the difficulty of this problem. The closest planet to Earth is Proxima b, located just 4.24 light years away, which seems paltry compared with the distances to which our superhabitable planets are located. But despite being located in the habitable zone of its star, and probably telluric like Earth, Proxima b is not a superhabitable planet it orbits a red dwarf. To reach Proxima b at the speed of our current probes, i.e. 15 kilometers per second, or 9 miles per second, would take 60,000 years. However, astrophysicists are not giving up hope of one day reaching an extrasolar planet. There are other technologies that could make this kind of trip possible more quickly but the few leads we have need to be perfected. And the technology that will be used when such a journey is finally undertaken is certainly yet to be discovered. One of today's most advanced technologies is ionic propulsion. Ion propulsion engines extract electrons from a fluid such as xenon then use electric and magnetic fields to accelerate. This technology was used on ESA's Smart One probe, which flew between 2003 and 2006. After a certain acceleration time, ion propulsion engines can reach an impressive speed of 60 kilometers per second, or 37 miles per second. However, if we hope to reach Proxima b within a reasonable time frame, say less than 40 years, we'd have to carry a ton of cargo. 
a mass greater than the entire universe. So we can't really consider this technology to be the ideal solution for getting to a superhabitable planet one day. Scientists are currently studying other propulsion technologies, and although they are far from operational, they are advanced enough to offer hope. The Vasimir motor for variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket is one such promising technology. This engine can deliver high thrust while retaining a high specific impulse, which was not the case with the ion propulsion engine. NASA is working on this engine with a view to reaching Mars. After all, there's a gulf between Earth's neighbor and a superhabitable planet over 2,500 light years away. Perhaps in the decades to come, other propulsion technologies will enable us to reach closer planets, and little by little, we'll be able to push back the boundaries of science. There are still other avenues to explore, such as antimatter, which is made up of negative protons, antiprotons, and positive electrons, positrons. Antimatter is very expensive to manufacture, and we don't know how to store it, but it has extraordinary potential, especially in terms of energy. We could also artificially create a magnetosphere that would act like a magnetic sail and move through the universe, propelled by the solar wind. The feasibility of solar sail propulsion has already been demonstrated and is even the basis of the Breakthrough Starshot project launched in 2016 and supported by astrophysicist Stephen Hawking. This project aims to send thousands of space probes weighing around one gram, equipped with solar sails to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system to us, where Proxima Centauri b is located. Developing the technology to travel so far into space is very complicated. Finding a technology fast enough to make the trip on the scale of a human lifetime isn't the only problem facing scientists. We also need to be able to communicate from one planet to another, and traveling signals from one planet to another adds to the difficulties. And that's just the beginning of the long list of details that need to be considered for a project of this scale. We've now come to the end of this exciting journey into the heart of super-inhabitable worlds. Yes, our universe certainly contains planets with conditions even more favorable to life than Earth. But have they been discovered? How far will we have to go to find them? Will we ever be able to prove that superhabitable worlds harbor intelligent life? Will we ever be able to travel there? All these questions divide the scientific community. In any case, what we can say is that superinhabitable worlds have yet to reveal all their secrets. And we may not yet be ready to discover what they will reveal when the time comes.